Thank you for being with us, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jessica Colligan, and I'm happy to welcome you on behalf of Fairfield's Alumni Relations Office. This is the latest event in our virtual celebration of 50 years of women at Fairfield University. And we have been able to celebrate so many accomplished women throughout this year. And we are so excited to have tonight's panelists join that list. Our conversation will be moderated by Dr. Marty Lomonico, who is a professor in Fairfield's Department of Visual and Performing Arts and also the director of our theater program. Before I turn things over to her, I have just a couple of housekeeping notes. First, I ask that you please keep your microphones muted so that way there are no other distractions. And I recommend you use the speaker view in Zoom rather than gallery view so that way the focus on your screen is on our featured speakers. And finally, we encourage you to use the chat for any questions that you would like our panelists to answer if we have time at the end of the conversation. And now I will turn things over to Dr. Lamonica. Thank you, Jessica. And many thanks to Janet Canapa, the head of alumni relations who invited me to present this program. Just a year ago, as the pandemic was shuttering our theaters and forcing us all onto Zoom screens, the Quick Center for the Arts invited me to develop programming for a new series, still going strong, called The Quick Live. I created a six-part program, Marty Talks Theater, which celebrated Theater Fairfield's new position as the resident theater company in the Quick's Black Box Theater. Three episodes were devoted to spotlighting some of our distinguished theater graduates who happened to be all men. As much as I love the guys, and I love you guys, um, I am so regretted not having an opportunity to celebrate the great women of Theater Fairfield until tonight. So thank you, Janet, for giving me this platform to virtually invite three outstanding women of our theater program whose achievements will knock your socks off. I'm gonna briefly introduce each of them to you and then give them the stage to uh, share with you their journeys from their undergraduate days at Fairfield to their present work. This will also give me an opportunity to publicly thank each of these extraordinary women for the great gifts they have bestowed on our theater program and Theater Fairfield. And I'm going in order of graduation. Uh, age and beauty, right? So uh, we're gonna start with Erin Pender Levine. Erin's story is probably the one you would most expect to hear from someone who was a theater major uh, because she worked for many years as a professional performer. She graduated in 1995 as a double major in theater and English with a double minor in music and education. She was a fixture on Theater Fairfield stage for her entire four years. Clearly a triple threat performer, as we call them in the business, actor, singer, dancer, even then. And she took leading roles in so many of our shows, Light Up the Sky, Starting Here, Starting Now, Museum, Working, and Twelfth Night, among many others. It was her transformative performance as Festy. She'll never, she, originally she was, cursing me for giving her that role. True. Of course, True. she completely transformed the production with her brilliant singing and dancing clown in Twelfth Night, which I had the privilege of directing. And that propelled all of my subsequent Shakespeare productions where song and dance became integral to the storytelling. So thank you, Erin, for that. Um, Erin went from Fairfield right into professional theater starting with Summer Stock at the Berkshire Theater Festival in Massachusetts, and then into two national touring companies, Beauty and the Beast and 42nd Street. To recover from two years on the road, which is really hard work, she moved to New York City, where she did several Broadway workshops, national commercials, off-Broadway stints, and she also performed regionally. I caught her in a chorus line at the old Downtown Cabaret Theater in in uh, Bridgeport, a professional house. Now, even before she came to Fairfield, Erin, as a young teenager, was a world champion Irish dancer. And right at this moment in her professional career, Irish dance was becoming a worldwide phenomenon. And Erin was perfect 
perfectly positioned to reap the benefits. She performed all over the world, Australia, Germany, Dublin, finally back to New York City, where she was in Riverdance on Broadway. Just yesterday, she reminded me of a poignant moment in Broadway history, so reminiscent of our own time now. After September 11th, Riverdance, along with many other Broadway shows, did not reopen. And this is, we're still in a blackout on Broadway, right? Now we're hoping to reopen in September, finally. By then, Erin was teaching dance in Connecticut and she decided to open an Irish dancing school, what is now known as the Pender Keedy Irish Academy of Dance, which she still owns and has operated for the past 25 years. Along the way, she got married and had four wonderful children. Dr. Jennifer Katona graduated from Fairfield in 1998 with a double major in theater and English literature. In those days, she was the rock of Theater Fairfield. She was one of those can-do students who so ably brought faculty, staff, and the current students together to keep all the balls in the air, miraculously. And she is still a can-do personality as the president and founder of Three Looms Creative edu Educational Consulting, a relatively new venture, which she'll tell you all about in a few minutes. Simultaneously, back to the can-do, she serves as Director of Arts Education for the Norwalk Public Schools here in Connecticut. She is also the founder and former director of the Graduate Program in Educational Theater at the City College of New York, which is part of CUNY, where she oversaw the certification of pre- and in-service theater teachers, as well as the training of non-certified theater educators. Jen is an arts advocate, curriculum writer, teacher mentor, and school reformer. I have been privileged to work closely with Jen for the past several years here at Fairfield, where we've launched teacher, teaching artist and educational theater internships under her direction in the Bridgeport Public Schools. Watching her work closely with inner city students at Bridgeport's Harding and Bassing High Schools has been awe-inspiring both to me and my current students. And we have fingers crossed that she will soon launch a full educational theater program here at Fairfield. Thank wow. you, Jen. Our most recent graduate in this distinguished triumvirate is Katie McLaughlin, who is a 2007 Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Fairfield with a BA in theater. Katie completed the honors program with high distinction devoting her thesis project, which I had the privilege to direct, to the work of Brazilian playwright director theoretician Augusto Boal, whose Theater of the Oppressed propelled social justice theater throughout the world. And thanks to Katie, here at Fairfield. Her work propelled my and the theater program's focus on social justice theater, which has now become a cornerstone of our pedagogy and production. Thank you, Katie. After Fairfield, Katie spent a year with the Jesuit Volunteer Corps North, Northwest in Billings, Montana, where she spent time performing in a professional improv troupe and teaching summer classes at a local theater. Katie explored nonprofits and education before finding her career niche in software and tech. She spent over 11 years in various roles across talent, training, enablement, and change management on the inside of software companies like Wayfair, Upserve, Rocket Lawyer, and Vista Consulting Group. In 2020, Katie founded McLaughlin Method, a boutique consulting firm focused on improving company culture in mature tech companies through interactive training programs. Katie leverages her theater training with her clients, folding in games and exercises to help managers and executives to build relationships, connect with, motivate, and inspire their teams, all through theater. A hearty welcome back to you all. Thank you. Thank you. So let's start with Erin. 
and Erin's journey. And all three women have some illustrations to help uh, help you imagine their journeys along the way. Wow, starting here, starting now. <laughs> It's all to you, Aaron. <laughs> I feel like I feel like Marty, you told my whole story, but um, here are some pictures of my time at Theater Fairfield. When I got to Fairfield, and it's funny because my mom and dad are listening, um, I said, I think I want to go to conservatory. I think I want to do this in high school. And my mom and dad were like, you are not going to school for theater. That's not for people like us. That's for, you know, you're not doing that. So I got to Fairfield, I tried out for my first play and I got the lead and I was like, oh, I guess I'll do this. And immediately Marty was like, you should just be a theater major with English, with whatever. And I was like, okay, okay, I'll, I'll beg my parents. So my parents let me be an English and a theater major. And I'll tell you this, my English major was really easy. My theater major was really, really hard. And Dr. L actually taught me how to write Dr. L taught me how to not only perform on stage. I think I actually knew how to perform on stage. I didn't realize how many other things go into theater and how much, how important every aspect of theater is. And Dr. L helped change me in that way and actually helped me, I feel, get hired and stay hired through every job I've ever had. So thank you for that, Marty. So this is me in two productions. I will move on from there. So when I graduated from Fairfield, um, I also broke it to my parents that I was going to um, try to be a working actress. And they were like, uh, I don't know what's gonna happen here. But I immediately landed a job at the Berkshire Theater Festival. That's my very bad 90s headshot on the left. Um, I remember a casting director telling me it was very harsh. So now I'm a blonde. But anyway, um, so I got, I started working and I will tell you this, I think I waited tables for a month and I was terrible at it. And I, that's the only time I ever had to wait tables. Anyway, I was very blessed and very lucky because like Marty said, I could sing, dance and act. So I started on a journey through musical theater. This is me in Beauty and the Beast. That's me in 42nd Street. I toured the country with both for two years. And that's us on the bus, on a touring bus. And after a while, being on a touring bus gets very old. So I broke it to my parents again that I was getting a New York City apartment with some other girls from Fairfield. And I was, I, I was like, I'm going to get a Broadway show. I'm going to get commercials. I'm going to get an agent or I'm quitting. So I ended up getting a lot of off-Broadway shows and a few national commercials. But then Riverdance came to town and I went in to sing for Riverdance. And they said, well, your singing is fine, but it looks like you're a really good Irish dancer. I was like, yeah, but I really, I, I, I don't know if I want an Irish dance anymore. They were like, no, we need you. So I stepped right into a Broadway show after trying so hard to get on Broadway with my, you know, all my musical theater training. But anyway, I took it and I was blessed and very lucky to be on Broadway for about nine months. And then September 11th happened. And I happened to meet um, a man as well during this time on Broadway. And I ended up getting married and I was working in New York City, but I got an offer. That's my family. As you can see, they're also very theatrical. This was the Front Step Project. I don't know if you guys heard about this. During COVID, they photographers went around and took pictures of families on front steps, like living at home. And my husband was like, we're not taking one of those boring pictures. We're going to get dressed up. And my kids were like, oh, yeah. So this is, this is how what happened with our picture. We didn't have a perfect picture. Um, but anyway, where was I? Oh yeah. So I was in river dance and I started teaching Irish dancing, chap jazz and ballet up in Stanford. And I loved it. I got a huge following. I, at some points have had 200 students at the moment. I probably have 150 students, including my own children. And I have 
now I have dancers who are in river dance and I have world national uh, champions and it's very fulfilling. Once again, I don't have a desk job. I run a dancing school with very talented um, friends of mine since childhood. And I um, occasionally sing at weddings and funerals and that's about my time I sing anymore. But that's my journey through Theater Fairfield. Thank you for having me, Marty. Thank you, Erin. Fabulous, fabulous photos. Thank you for sharing those. This is wonderful. Boy, journey down memory lane, right? Dr. Jen Katona, class of 98. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so I am Jen Katona and I am the president of Three Looms Creative Education Consulting. And my journey, uh, my time at Fairfield definitely launched my journey. So when I was at Fairfield, um, I was able to be in a lot of shows, but one of my greatest gifts that Fairfield gave me was kind of the, the mandate that we had to do everything. We had to work backstage, we had to hang lights, we had to sweep the floors, we had to design the posters, hang the posters. It didn't matter. Um, every job had to be done at some point in your four years there. Um, simultaneously, when I was at Fairfield, I was really involved in campus ministry and I was going into Bridgeport and doing a lot of tutoring. Um, I was teaching dance a lot. Um, and those two gifts that Fairfield gave me is what has equipped me to have the career in arts education that I've had. Um, so after I graduated Fairfield, I went to New York City, maybe with the idea of being a performer, um, but I never waited tables either, and I've worked every day since I left Fairfield, uh, but moved right into arts education and had this ability to do everything. So particularly in New York City, but any teacher, uh, any theater teacher who's going to work in an after school theater program has to be the costume designer, the lighting designer, the choreographer, the set, right? Every stage manager. And I had all of that knowledge and I had all of those skills. So I was really lucky and I worked all the time. Um, I was a teaching artist. This was 1998, didn't really have a title then, but really formalized that into a, a viable career for um, young people now. I was lucky enough to work for the New Victory Theater and the Guggenheim Museum, Tada, and Arts Connection. Um, then I moved to Sunset Park, Brooklyn and took a job as a seventh grade teacher and ran their theater program there and did a lot of devised work and devised musicals. Um, and so I was able to really see theater from all the different avenues. Uh, and then in 2007, I was um, hired to start the graduate program in educational theater at the City College of New York in 2007. It was only one of seven universities in the country that was certifying theater teachers. New York City didn't get theater certification until 2005. So this was the first public education uh, opportunity in New York City. The only other one was NYU. And because I, of my Fairfield education, where it was really everybody pitches in, and I was the only faculty, one of the first things I did was to get a small group of grad students to help me run the program, which was a model I took from Marty. So when I was at Fairfield, I was a, I don't even remember the titles, it's a long time ago. I think I was a production coordinator, I was an assistant production coordinator, but I remember that um, we're all in this together. I think there was a small stipend, and I took that model right to City College and said, I, I need help and let's get the students and everybody wins. I also took from Fairfield this really hands-on practical experience. Every, you, you gotta learn, you gotta get in it and be messy. And in my work in education, that means getting in front of a group of students as fast as you can. Um, so I started a theater program at the neighboring K-8 school. There's a school that happens to be on our campus at City College. Uh, they didn't have a theater program and so I started one. Um, and I brought the grad students over and about 80% of our classes were taught inside this school and we turned that middle school into our lab school. Um, and when I left there, uh, we had started that program. And when I started the program there, I maybe had like 10 kids in the play and four people in the audience. And when I left, it was really a staple and we had changed the culture of that school and that community. Uh, we started doing potluck dinners on the night of the show. And this picture here is of a young girl named Rosdeli Cipriani. She played, she was, a, do you know her? <laughs> you might know her from uh, What the Constitution Means to Me on Broadway. I saw her in What the Constitution Means to Me. Yes, you can see it now me. on yeah. Amazon. Well, she was one of my middle school students. She played uh, sixth grade. She played young Nala for me. I'm also uh, proudly the president of the chair of the board of um, 
the American Alliance for Theater and Education. And when I hosted the conference in New York City two years ago, she was my keynote speaker. So she got to come back to New York and she's on the stage of the New Victory Theater, speaking to a sold out house of theater educators from across the country. So that's a really nice moment where I got to bring all my worlds together. Uh, my new work now with Three Looms is I do a lot of consulting. So I work a lot for the New York City Office of Arts and Special Projects, the Arthur Miller Foundation, locally the Westport Country Playhouse. Um, before COVID, I was working closely with Come From Away and designed their I Am an Islander project where we take schools in Newfoundland and schools in New York City. And this was pre-COVID, but we would Zoom and interview each other. And then both schools would create devised theater pieces um, similar to the work of Come From Away. Yeah. And currently I'm working on a project with the National Theater in the New York City Office of Arts and Special Projects, building out some American curriculum for some of their shows. Uh, really exciting work that I got to do with Marty in the last few years um, was the start of our internship. So working with Harding High, um, we did some pre-show residency work around um, Antigone. That was our first show. I've done about four of these. Uh, the last one I was able to do was with my work with Norwalk. And so these are pictures of students of Norwalk uh, High School, two of our two high schools here, um, getting a pre-workshop on Fort Embrace. So we really tied it into this was happened to be a show taking place during the Trump administration. So a play about kind of a bloated up character seemed fitting to make that connection. And here they are uh, reading some of the lines and, and getting some of the context before they go to see the play. Uh, and the last thing I'll speak about is the work I'm doing now in Norwalk, which is really around arts integration and school reform. So I am working with a K-5 elementary school and a middle school here to uh, build out an arts integrated um, house, house, school system. So what I do is I build school culture through ensemble. So what do we love about theater, right? We love rehearsal. We love getting in a circle. We love that camaraderie that we have. And so school should be like that. So at my schools that I work with, um, the students every morning get into their ensemble spots and the whole school does a warm up together. And at the end of the day, they get back into their ensemble spots and they do a cool down together. And then throughout the day, they have arts integrated work into their classrooms. And then I work to support their arts teachers so that they're getting a quality arts education. And then we build out their facilities. What do we know about theater? We know lighting and sound and set all of the aesthetics and design are important and tell a story. And we should bring that mindset into our schools. So I get to redesign schools using the aesthetics of theater education. And, um, and right now I'm thinking about what role the arts play in post COVID classrooms and thinking a lot about the SEL work and the arts. So working a lot with school counselors and saying, you don't need to go bring in all these extra people, just go to your arts teachers and have students um, think about their feelings and, and communicate their ideas, but let's do it through the arts. So it's been really amazing to foster my career around some of these real staple things I learned um, back at Theater Fairfield over 25 years ago. And I wouldn't be doing the things I'm doing without this time. So thank you for having me back and letting you share, letting me share my story. Thanks, Jen. <laughs> I told you these women are gonna <laughs> knock your socks off. The third one to knock your socks off is Katie McLaughlin, class of 2007. Take it away, Katie. So, well, thanks, uh, Marty, for having me. And I, I didn't know Erin or Jen, but I'm so glad to know you both now. Uh, you're both very impressive. I'm very excited. So, um, as Marty mentioned earlier, I started my own business in the last year called McLaughlin Method. Um, and, but while I was at Theater Fairfield. Uh, I too was on kind of the Theater Fairfield board. That's me down in the bottom left uh, at our awards banquet at the end of the year where we always gave paper plate awards. And uh, even in that moment of giving every, we gave every single person who came to our theater awards banquet, regardless of what your role was, we gave everyone a, an award because there was something we could celebrate about everyone. And I think that's something that I've taken away and really have brought into my business career. Um, while at, at Fairfield, I was not on stage a ton. My only two performances uh, are pictured here. I was in As You Like It, uh, and then also a class act, which was a, a compilation of poetry pieces. And, uh, but otherwise I was more frequently seen wearing one of these black shirts uh, at, with my fellow stage managers or tech uh, crew. And uh, I had the great opportunity to 
trained some other stage managers after, uh, after me as well. Um, and like Marty mentioned, I actually don't, I, I, because I've been talking about theater and its, its impact on my business, um, I've been trying to remind myself of when I first got introduced to Theater of the Oppressed and I don't actually remember the moment, but I remember being like, this is amazing. And I will show you a little bit about that in a moment. And um, my experience of writing my honors thesis on the Theater of the Oppressed, and as you can see from the title, the value of theater offstage has really just stuck with me for my entire career and driven uh, most of the ways that I interact with people in business. Um, since Theater Fairfield, I also uh, still have had some fun uh, performing and uh, I have been in different improv troupes and done, uh, I think I've performed in six different states uh, doing improv. I also fell into ballroom dance. I was part of the ballroom dance club at Fairfield as well. And um, as you can see, I also did some competitions while, while I lived in Utah. Um, you know, as a, as a theater person, you are always poised and ready for a costume party. Um, so that, that doesn't uh, stop <laughs> after, after college. Um, and then of course, public speaking um, as well. So, uh, and then part of what I have loved um, so much is that I have been able to adopt uh, or adapt all the lessons that I learned from theater into the business world. And, um, you know, like Marty mentioned in my bio, the tech world has really been um, a place where I've felt like I have thrived. And, and, you know, Jen, you kind of reminded me of the importance of that word ensemble. And I really feel like that is what a lot of the tech world is trying to do and trying to create in their cultures is this sense of ensemble and community. Um, but while I was there, I also found that they weren't always fulfilling on the promise of a ensemble based company or as a, you know, a community where there were still a lot of workplace challenges around, you know, toxic uh, communication and, um, you know, managers who had no training. And so through, I actually took these roles um, because I, I knew it eventually I wanted to bring theater of the oppressed and theater in general to the business world, but that I needed some street cred. And so, uh, and happened to find a career in, in the business world that I also really loved. Um, but now I realize that it is my theater background that has made the biggest difference for me in terms of connecting with others, uh, being on an effective team, meeting deadlines, uh, and so many more things that I'm sure we're going to talk about. But um, in my business, McLaughlin Method, you know, I focus really heavily on building actionable skills and practicing. We have to have that rehearsal for reality uh, that uh, Augusta Bawal, who is the founder of the Theater of the Oppressed, uh, talks about. And so I recreate that in my workshops and programs with various companies and with leaders. And the biggest thing that I use from the theater of the press is a technique called image theater, which is all about expressing yourself without knowing the right words. And um, this is a really awesome opportunity for people to build empathy by being able to step into the image that somebody else creates and see what their vantage point is. And I feel like that's another thing that I have gotten from theater that I wanna share with the world because when doing scene study and thinking about these characters, every character has value, including the villain. And you have to find the reasons why each of those characters is motivated to do what they're going to do. And you have to use different techniques and different tactics to try to get what you want throughout the course of that show. And I feel like that is probably the biggest lesson that I've taken away when it comes to persuasive communication or building teams. Um, so um, I did some in-person workshops before COVID, of course, and you know, lots of fun to be had. Uh, and now I've been adapting these theater in business um, exercises and uh, games into a virtual setting. Um, and just a quick plug, I do have a free virtual event coming up. If anybody wants to see this in action and if you're leading a remote team, I'll pop the link in the chat. Um, but yeah, thanks again for having me, Marty, and um, just so honored to be here. Wow, thank you. Bravo.
I told you, knock your socks off. Very impressive, impressive women. Um, we've talked a lot about how they have taken their theater background, which, you know, unfortunately people t seem to think, oh, theater major, oh, actor, oh, unemployed waiter. <laughs> and um, this was one of the things, this was one of the reasons why several of them mentioned, I never waited tables or I only waited tables for two minutes and I was terrible at it and that was it. But um, there's so much baggage uh, that comes with being, oh, a theater major because it's so misunderstood. And um, I think I'm just gonna jump, Katie, when we were talking before we started, uh, you said you've got a great story to share about the challenges, not just of being a woman, opening your own business and making it in the business world, but being a, God forbid, theater major who is also a woman. Can, can you kind of unpack that for us, please? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I kind of learned pretty quickly that moving to New York was not for me. And I, you know, had to have a traditional resume, not a theater resume, and had to you know, especially early in my career where I didn't have as much experience, um, I had to, you know, I had my education on there. And there were definitely jobs that I knew I was qualified for, but I never got a call for. And, you know, there would be times within my, um, you know, within my career when I would tell people that I had a theater degree, um, the, my colleagues, they would be like, oh, well, that makes so much sense. Um, but m meanwhile, there were often these times where I was in job interviews and I would have to, what felt like I had to justify, you know, the skills that I had from theater and, you know, from before theater, I think that the, the, my theater degree and my background just really got enhanced by, by the work that I, you know, did at Fairfield. Um, it certainly didn't hurt that one of my, that my position on the Theater Fairfield board was the business position. <laughs> so that looked really good. Um, but, you know, it, it's definitely been times in my career where I've been kind of boxed out of certain conversations because of my title um, or because of my degree. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's sad. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, I, I'm thinking about what we've got on our agenda and so much to talk about, but just in terms of theater training, I think Erin and, and Jen and Katie to, you know, really you took the theater ball and ran with it and reimagining theater. Jen and Kate and Erin are still within the performance world, but using theater training in different ways. I just want to open it up to have you add to the conversation in terms of the things about theater training that people who are not in theater or people who were not theater majors uh, would realize? You know, what were some of those takeaways that um, we might unpack a little bit more? Well, I mean, I'm, I, never, I never get flustered or nervous or when crazy things are happening around me, even in business or raising children, anything, nothing really flusters me. And I have to public speak a lot in just random settings. And everybody's like, wow, you're such a good speaker. I'm like, yeah, I was a theater major. <laughs> I'm like, That's what we did. But it, you know, it, it always helps you out to have all that training and just be able to fly by the seat of your pants. I also was um, the production manager, remember Marty, when we, and I think I got fired because I was so bad at it. Anyway, we won't mention that. <laughs> I don't remember. I, I think, only remember the good things, Erin. I, th I <laughs> think Kevin Ahern, Kevin Ahern helped me out. We like took it on together because I was, I was, you know. Wow. I um, I remember you saying to me in one of our reflections in the last few years that one of the greatest gifts about being a theater major is that the show always comes. There's no... You don't have, you can't push it back. The doors open at eight o'clock. And so people who do a lot of theater become part of that mentality of, well, it, it just has to get done. And so um, you're going to work harder or find more help or whatever you have to do. And I don't think everybody thinks, I know it, not everybody thinks that way. And so 
there is something really lovely about about having that and and not just say, you know, repeat myself, but that's what I try to bring to the schools is this, you know, it, if we can get the kids to kind of work towards these projects every few weeks, it builds that internal clock of there's a deadline and there's a little bit of urgency. And I think that that's really helpful in, in the world, in the real world. Um, and, I, and that's the only thing that theater can give you. There's, there's really nothing else, no other training that can prepare you for that. And preparation doing things over and over and over again. Children don't wanna do that anymore nowadays. And it's so important, like just showing up at rehearsal. We had to miss so much at Fairfield. I remember being like, but there's a dance. And <laughs> like, you can't go. I'm like, okay. But it taught you that from a very early, you know, it was, and you were strict about it. You were good. We had well, t-shirts made. It said, I can't, I have rehearsal. Yeah. I that's right. We still have those t-shirts. So, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. The other, the other thing I think that you learn is just the basic rule of theater, right? Like make a take a take a choice, make a choice, mm. take a chance. Did it work? Didn't work. Try it. Make another one. And that it was safe to do that. And that's just part of the process in theater. But again, how do we translate into real life? And mm. and in my work in schools, just trying to give kids that freedom to try something and not to be afraid to fail. Um, I think that's another thing only theater can teach you. I'll add on, Jen, to what you said about the show must go on, because I feel like that really set me up for, um, you know, any kind of project management type skills, right? Because, because you have this drop dead date of when an audience is going to show up and you have to backwards plan all of the things that you're doing. And, you know, especially in the tech world where things are being built all the time, I see deadlines slip all the time. And I'm like, what <laughs> you guys have to meet the deadline the show must go on you know and i think that that element alone encourages you to creative problem solve right obviously theater is a very creative pursuit it really taps into that creative mindset but from a strategic problem solving perspective that must meet a deadline and also must follow this script and, you know, be true to the language of the script and have respect for that. I think that all means that you have to think creatively about the problems because there are some uh, kind of goalposts that you have to stay within. Great. Great. Yeah. As we, in fact, we still use that phrase in the theater program. We teach you the value of opening night. And, and people don't get it. And we have to explain what that means. But you have just all explained it really beautifully. Thank and I'll add, I'll add maybe a funny story. I remember it's not just opening night, but opening night with whatever comes at you, right? And the pandemic has taught us that. I yeah. think I've, but I remember one night, I remember one year you put in an order for some doors to get painted and they didn't come all year. And then they came the day of the show and took down all the doors in the theater and it was opening night and we had no doors. And so we had to figure that out. We had like 20 minutes. <laughs> and it, it, that was really- like, I completely forgot you know, about you remember that. that? What like, show in, was it? Do you I don't remember that, that part, but I, that's emblazoned of like, let's all just get it done. You know, there's no time to whine or complain about the fact that this happened and what are the odds, but we got to hang some black curtain. So grab yeah. the duct tape and get on a ladder. <laughs> and, but I think that that has, uh, Third me, me well at least on there. And call and call Carl. <laughs> Get Carl over here quickly to hang some curtains. <laughs> thank you. Welcome, Carl. You're welcome. <laughs> Carl ruling my husband, who is a professional scenic and lighting designer and who frequently has worked with us. Um, I also just want to give a shout out to my colleagues, Lynn Porter, who many of you worked with, and Julie Learson, who is, I think, on the Zoom with us, and our newest TV, Ann Kendall. Uh, still, for women department, right? Wow. We have, you know, we've had a few men over the years who have been on faculty, and certainly we have a lot of men. In fact, at least one is tuned in, Jake Hoffman, uh, one of our uh, most frequent and greatly loved guest artists and um, uh, adjunct faculty. But um, it's still a four-woman program, and it has been for a long time. So, yeah. I just want to go back to what Katie was talking about in terms of, of challenges and biases uh, against not just being a woman, but, but being a 
theater major. Um, Aaron and Jen, oh, Jen, you said, I know, I just, I'll give Aaron a, a chance for this too. Jen just said she just had a gender bias issue come up rather recently. Sure, it's only, well, you mentioned how you're a four woman uh, department and that was the case when I was there as well and always has been. And so uh, naively perhaps left college and thought, no one is gonna think that a woman can't do something, particularly in tech theater. Um, and so I have come up against that time and time again of being undermined when I walk into a theater as the production manager. Um, yeah, and just two weeks ago, we're, we're um, putting in some bids to renovate one of our auditoriums and we had all of the, and they happened to be men who came, happened to come down. Um, and they were asking me about the different lighting and, and just didn't believe anything I said. And I had to argue with them and, they were explaining to me how lights work and I hadn't put a spotlight on my list, but I don't need a spotlight. But they were explaining to me what a spotlight does. And I get that a lot in around tech theater, around lighting and sound. It's, very specific, it's a very specific thing that I get. Um, wow. Uh, yeah, just a lot, a lot, a lot of pushback on and constantly having to prove myself that I know how to run a light board and I know how to hang lights and I understand the concepts of lighting design. Um, but I will say the one, the only positive about that is because I'm an arts educator, I've written into curriculum that, because I think for so long, it's always been women will do, you know, female identifiers will be in costumes and male identifiers will go to the tech side and sound and lighting and have made really conscious efforts in working with pre-service theater teachers around writing curriculum that makes sure that those things do not happen and have real honest conversations about them. Um, and if I hadn't experienced that, I wouldn't even know to do that. So while I find it infuriating <laughs> to have to prove that I understand lighting design and hanging lights, um, it's, I think it's, it's helped me guide new teachers. That's great. Yeah. Erin, have you had any interesting experiences like that? Um, not really. I, I mean, yeah. I've, I've been pretty lucky in that way. You know, yeah, I think that I'm not really on the tech side. And as we know, when I used to be on the tech side, I remember you, Marty, just screaming props <laughs> when I was in charge of props. And I realized how hard things were like that. No, I have had been very, very lucky in the theater and I've worked with incredible people and um, I haven't run into any bias, but obviously I was on a different and in the dance world, women kind of rule too, not in the ballet world, but in my, in the realm that I am in. Good. Yes. How about, how about the business side? Did you get any, I mean, because certainly you run a business. That's a huge, yeah. that's a huge dance academy, right? That's a business. Yes. No, I, I've been very lucky, very nice people, parents. And I mean, if, if I have felt it, it, it didn't affect me. So I've been pretty lucky. Yes. And hopefully I'm raising three boys that won't ever do that to anyone else. That's more important, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, everybody is addressing that issue. I mean, I think we're finally at a point where we have enough really super professional women who are high up in their respective fields that we can truly nurture future generations and start changing those old paradigms, which I think is really important. I mean, I look back on my own, you know, career and nurturing, all of my mentors were men. Really? Yeah. yeah. See, my dance teacher was a woman too, like so, and a strong woman. And you were my, and you, you were our college professor and then my high school director was also a woman so that's interesting you know it's interesting though because marty all of all of my actually all of my good mentors uh in the business world have been men um you know i've had a couple of women who've been mentors um of mine or you know bosses and unfortunately some of them have been uh perpetuators of toxic behaviors and the more that i have uh, the more that I've gotten into the business world and been doing, you know, research on human behavior and performance in the business world, the more I've learned that, you know, as women, we can all fall prey in the business world to 
thinking that there's not enough room for all of us. And so we need to really assert our space and, uh, and be harder on women because they're going to need to work that much harder to like be successful in a world of men. Um, and I think it's one of those things that like has been really ingrained. Uh, and a lot of us, I know that there's been moments where I've realized like, wow, I maybe listen a little bit close, more closely when a man speaks in some of these meetings and that, you know, but we have to do that work ourselves in order to make sure that we don't perpetuate these culturally systemically ingrained behaviors. Yes. Completely. And that's our job, right? Yes. Particularly our job as I'm looking at all, all women on this screen, right? Yeah. Uh, and part of a larger project of celebrating 50 years of women at Fairfield, right? It's our job to nurture the current students and the new generations of both men and women yes. to respect and value the intelligence and artistry and dynamism of women. Yes, and so much of that comes with confidence, which Jen can tell you too, theater builds so much confidence in children and, yeah. and dance and everything else. I, I wish that the schools realized that, you know, it's not only sports, it's theater. It's, you know, and it's every aspect of theater. You need, you need confidence to be that person. That's right. And to stand up for yourself. That's right, that's right. How about takeaways? I mean, you've already been, you know, talking about, you know, why you're here today and thank you for all the very, very kind things you've said about the theater program and Theater Fairfield, but some other takeaways, maybe pieces of advice. I know that at least a few of my students are tuning in and certainly, we'll be putting the recording of this program under our featured alumni on the Fairfield uh, uh, Theater Fairfield website. Anybody who's interested, www.theater-fairfield.org, you can find out all about what we're up to right now. So takeaways from our distinguished, wonderful women of theater. Yeah, I would just say, and I don't know what your core, you know, what you're required to take anymore as a student there, but I would just say take whatever opportunities you can because it is that that resume building opportunity that you have right now. So whether if you're thinking if speaking to the students, if you're thinking right now that performance is your path and that you don't need to know some other aspect of the work, you also don't know what your life in 20 years is going to be like and why you might need that skill or what job you can pull on that lever for and say, I actually do know how to do that. So this is a kind of a free opportunity to build out your resume and take those skills. Um, and it might mean taking a lesser part in a show, but I think all of that in college right now is, is a really, really important time for you to be doing that. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I actually was in every single production I'm like sure every, every year that we did and we weren't allowed to be you had to do props I had to do costumes my friend Suzanne is here and I remember we had to do our costumes for 12th night and I was doing my costume and she was like okay you were I'm sewing it right I was sewing my shoes we're sewing it right. she was like, you need to sit over there and never ever sell again. She's like, sing us the song. I was like, okay, Suzanne, she'll, she'll tell the story now when I leave this room because she, it's, it's her favorite story. But I'm gonna say the same thing as Jen. I really learned the most from striking the set, putting the set up. My first play there, I had to wear a certain bodice that I didn't wanna wear. And I remember I didn't wear it one night and the, the costume designer went crazy on me. You had gotten this amazing woman from M Manhattan and she was like, it's so unprofessional, blah, blah, blah. But it taught me like to never ever do something like that ever again and undermine this, this person who has come and worked so hard on it. That was a big lesson. I learned so many lessons like that at Theater Fairfield, just doing silly things, showing up late, doing this, not, not staying at strike the whole time and then having to do something else, which once again, I'll say, when I went into my professional career, I was never late. I was never not prepared. I was never not 
kind to every single person who worked on the production. I, I you know, I knew if I brought my uh, costume person a coffee, they were going to be, I was going to be the first person they dressed, you know, like you, you learn little things like that, that help you in the theater world. So thank you, Marty. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Katie, do you want to add uh, your wisdom to this conversation? Sure. I mean, you know, to whether you're still at Fairfield or you are not, uh, I think that my big piece, my big takeaway and reminder to all of us is that we learn things through every moment of our lives. And regardless of where that skill was learned, you get to keep that skill and you can use that skill across all different things. And I've worked with a lot of folks uh, who are very afraid to write their resumes and don't feel like they can talk about the skills that they have or what they can do. And um, that's been actually one of my kind of side passion projects that I do is help my friends with their resumes because there is so much that you can celebrate about the contributions that you make in your workplace, in your classes, in your families. And so I would just encourage everyone to think a little bit broader about the skills that you have and where else you can use them because you all have gifts that you can offer. And I feel like that is a big thing that Theater Fairfield and you know my entire experience has taught me is that these same skills I can use in all these applications. And I just have to remember that I have them and start to think about how can I apply this? Beautiful, thank you. I just want to touch base again with Jessica, our wonderful host. If there's any questions, I've been looking in the chat and I don't see any, but I just want to make sure we have a few minutes to address questions. If there's anyone out there who would love to hear more from uh, our distinguished guests. Yeah, I haven't seen anything come through, but by all means, as Dr. Lamonico said, if anybody has anything they'd like to answer, we did leave a few minutes for that. So feel free. But in the meantime, thank you all. This has been awesome. This is such a great night. And I just love the, the shared experiences, even though you didn't know each other when you were on campus. There's obviously, there's that common bond and the experiences that you had as part of Theater Fairfield. And obviously, Dr. Lamonico being that connecting tie, which is really cool to hear about. So thank you all so much. Um, I want to encourage everybody who is on this event, please check out our event calendar at fairfield.edu slash alumni events. We do still have some upcoming virtual events over the next couple of weeks. And we have been loving doing this. As I said, we've really been able to celebrate so many wonderful women during this anniversary year. And we're coming to the end of it now, but I think this was a great one to have as one of our last few events. And it was really a different perspective having this theater background than some of the other groups that we've been able to highlight. So thank you all so much. Thank you all for being here and you're getting some kudos in the, in the comments. So I think everybody really enjoyed this. Oh goodness. It's Oh, wow, my longtime props person, Jean Demusio, is on. <laughs> Do any of you remember Jean? Wow, she's she's been here tonight. I've got some current students on. Taylor, thank you, Jay, Katie Gillette, welcome. Elise Bochinski, who has performed with Theater Fairfield several times. Adam Jones, I don't know Adam, but he's been saying lovely things to us all, which is just great. Thank you, Adam. Um, super. So any questions? We're still here for a few minutes. Tracy Ferguson, one of my current majors. Um, this is great. Marty, um, what, what I would say to the theater majors too at Fairfield, because when I was there, sometimes I questioned mm -hmm. if I should be at a conservatory or if I should be at a bigger theater school. But in truth, I would have never gotten the opportunities the stage time, met the people. I mean, I was looking back at all my pictures these past two days and I'm like, oh my God, my son is looking at colleges now. And I'm like, he really, it just helps you so much sometimes to be in a small program where everybody knows you. I mean, look at my relationship with you, Dr. Lamonago. <laughs> I, I don't know if I would have had that at such a big school. So that is just kudos to Theater Fairfield. And don't worry, you're you're probably in the perfect spot for you and take advantage of it all. Uh, one of our 2015 grads, Katie Gillette, uh, would like to know what advice would you give to some recent grads who may feel discouraged due to COVID? 
I, I'm happy to, to feel that one, at least initially. So I graduated in 2007 when the economy completely tanked. <laughs> so um, I feel you, Katie, and other recent grads. And I would just say um, there are going to be more jobs and there are plenty of things that you can do based on all the skills that you have. And, you know, kind of going back to my earlier point, um, and I, I'd be more than happy to, to talk with you directly if you need creative ideas and a different thought process there. But, um, but hold out hope there, it will come back. And, you know, one of my first jobs outside of me doing a year of volunteer service, which I also recommend, it was a great opportunity to get actual like job uh, credentials on my resume. But one of my first jobs was in retail at that time. You know, so sometimes you have to take a job that you don't think is is like a job you want to be doing and you know that's I built a whole career in tech based off of a customer service job that I hated at first but then really found my stride so you never know where that next path is going to lead Katie we're all going to be calling you to all right resumes <laughs> <laughs> and thank you Aaron for those great words that you, when I was trying to negotiate um Katie Gillette's um uh, question. I uh, failed to say thank you for just saying what you just said, which is fantastic. Any final thoughts, final questions, anything before we tune out? We're just coming up to an outer hour. Uh, Jay Kaufman, one of our uh, listening and responding, a theater skill that every student should leave with. That's a great question. Thank you, Jake. You know, Marty, I would just say to you, thank you and the rest of the faculty from when I was there, from when Pender was there to, to now. But one thing I think is, you know, theater is always evolving. And there are some things that I think Theater Fairfield has really connected with, like some of the projects you're doing now. And then there's some things that I think you've made stayed true to um, that are, because they're important for us to learn. And I think that as the world changes and things get faster and more digitized, it was probably could be easy to do things a little bit differently. But from what I know from going back and working a little bit with you, there's still that really everybody has to get their hands dirty because this is really what theater is. Um, and that has shifted, but you, you guys haven't. And I think that that's really important. Um, and, it, you know, Theater Fairfield might not be the glossiest theater program, but it is the one that is going to best prepare you. I, I mean, this is not, this is a humble thing, but to your credit, I was offered four jobs within three months of graduating. Um, and I've never not worked in the arts and it's only because of, of Fairfield and, and that you just got to get it. You got to do it. You said I was a can do, but you guys made, made us do that. And you continue to do that for your students. And I don't think they maybe don't know it yet, but it's going to be what, what, um, keeps them going. So thank you for your commitment to, to just to stay into that core value of what is important for theater majors to know. Thank you. Thanks. This has been such a delight. It's so great seeing the three of you again. And thank you for coming back and know that you're always welcome uh, on in person live when we can get back to campus, which hopefully will be very soon. And um, the Theater Fairfield door is always open. So please come and grace us again with your presence. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of the night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.